Um, Ted Pasek, he's a, a petroleum geologist from um, UT Austin. He had this slide, which I think is a really effective one. And basically, it's effective because it's simple. It's showing that you know, if you assume all the oil in the world or all the hydrocarbons out there is a piggy bank, um, you can only get a certain portion of that out, the green portion. The rest has to stay in the ground. And there are physical reasons why that is so and economic reasons tied to those. But this is another really key basic concept a lot of people are missing in this whole discussion. You can't get most of the oil that's down there. I'm just going to run through a couple of really quick uh, studies and reports that have come out this year. Again, from this very recent report from the IEA, here's a graph of production and what they think will happen going forward. So you'll see the dark blue um, that trends down, and that's all the conventional oil. So this is what you know, the, the international experts are saying is going to happen to conventional oil. That little yellow ribbon on the top, that's basically the tar sands, the really hard stuff to get. And the purple are gas liquids. This big light blue wedge they define as fields yet to be developed or found. So what you need to do is take this picture and put it side by side with that earlier diagram of the discoveries and you know, see if those make sense to you side by side. Our own EIA last year in 2009 has a very similar picture. So all the, you know, the stuff on the bottom is conventional oil and then the, the narrow ribbons on top are the harder things to get to that have been accounted for. And again, you've got this you know, unidentified projects. You know, they, there's a lot of pressure to want that blue line to go up. And so I think you know, that's kind of the assumption. And then it's a matter of how do you fill in the, everything below that line. But this is what I hope we, we uh, keep in mind throughout this conference. This is really striking. The military, which, you know, they're not elected officials. They don't have the kind of a, you know, immediate accountability to, the, to, the, to a disgruntled populace that an elected politician has. They're getting really serious about this. And they did a report called the, the Joint Operating Environment that they do periodically. But last, this year, they had released one that did a really deep look on, um, on oil, on energy in general. And they're saying by 2012, surplus oil production capacity could entirely disappear. And as early as 2015, that's five years from now, the shortfall in output could reach nearly 10 million barrels a day. And we all know that the U.S. uses about 19 million barrels a day or thereabouts. So they're talking about in five years, half of the U.S. consumption could be off the world market. The militaries around the world are not the only ones that are, that are putting out very serious studies on this. In the UK, a couple of reports came out that are very interesting this year from the industry. And uh, one that I thought was really fascinating, you might want to take a look at, was from Lloyd's of London. So basically, they're the oldest underwriters on the planet, and they know a thing or two about risk management. So this report called Lloyd's 360, um, Google that and take a look at it. I'm going to just run through really quickly some of the basic impacts in the global economy. I think the upshot of all of the conference for me was that, you know, this statement here, the era of cheap energy is over. And that's something that I think not everyone has come to realize yet. But the problem is that everything we have today, our infrastructure, our society, everything we do, it's been optimized for oil that was probably about $25, $30 a barrel. Oil's about $90 a barrel now, and it's not going to go back down nearly to the level it was before. So we have, we have a, a design problem that we have to think about. One of the biggest concerns is, you know, we're, we're really struggling to come out of the, the recession, but as, as the oil price starts to come back up with demand, you're going to hit a point where the energy prices are going to start to cripple the economy again and send it right back down to where it was. That's, that's one of the things that they talked about at the conference that we'll want to be looking for. You know, what pattern going forward economically are we going to be seeing? Are we going to be seeing the sawtooth pattern of, of you know, price spikes and drop in demand and and trying to get back up to, uh, to uh, economic prosperity again. And then long term, this is a very interesting systems diagram um, that I just pulled off the web. Basically, it's showing oil production on the left coming into the system without going into any of the detail, really. What you've got is, is a series of, of uh, reinforcing feedback loops that this touches on. And where, you know, if, if the right or the wrong things all align, they're just the just so, you've got this cascading effect. 
So, you know, oil production is so central to the economy. If that affects the economy, you know, choices like how much we can invest in alternatives uh, becomes impacted. You know, how, how our ability to, to um, sustain the current infrastructure that we have, those two things start to compete because you can't do everything. And you can kind of see where this leads to the right in the worst case. Um, this is the kind of the final few slides here. Um, in terms of policy development, we just have to first realize where we use the oil in our economy. We have to work hard to get it out everywhere from every sector. Uh, to our, that will be to our benefit. But if we're not really attacking transportation, we're not going to have any impact um, worthwhile. It's mainly cars, light trucks, and heavy trucks. That, that population of vehicles there is about 75% of that transportation bar. Um, plan B, you know, this slide, I, I think John and I must have con conferred before our presentations because it's pretty much the same idea. We have to do a lot of things. We have to do it legal, uh, regionally. We have to do it locally. So that, I'm, I know we'll talk uh, a great length at this conference about those things. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of um, frustration at the conference in Washington about what isn't happening. Um, and that was, you know, People who are very expert, very, very, you know, have high level access um, themselves are frustrated that the message isn't getting through. James Schlesinger talked to us, and uh, he was basically not providing any, any uh, reason for hope in the near term from our elected officials. And I appreciated his candor. I think it's helpful to, to have that, you know, recognized. Uh, I will. Um, James Schlesinger says, there is no reason for optimism. We are likely to see pseudo-solutions, misleading alternatives, and sheer sloganeering. Um, energy independent, in, independence, getting off foreign oil, and the like. All of that sheer sloganeering we have seen to this point. Um, Dr. Bartlett, who's been in Congress for a number of years and kind of carrying the cause, uh, gave another uh, great presentation and, and, and very <laughs> Uh, very much candor on this point, saying the country's ignorance of energy is astounding. In this respect, we have a truly representative form of government. This is a guy who's been on the floor of the House 48 times giving one-hour speeches to his colleagues on this stuff. But he's not run out of hope. Um, this is just to say that, you know, even if, if kind of the political order isn't there yet, other people who have a lot of influence are, are getting it. And the military seems to be one of those, um, one of those populations. Obviously, we'll be talking a lot at this conference about local leaders and what they're doing. This is just a, one um, example from Bloomington, Indiana, that had a peak oil task force. And they came up with their own report and their own list of, of uh, things that they should be focusing on. This is on the web. We got a lot of changes ahead, and I think there's no better advice than from Dr. Howard himself, which is, our ignorance is not so vast as our failure to use what we know. Thanks. <laughs>